Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And it's indeed a pleasure for me this morning to be part of Bethel Presbyterian Church, and I want to personally thank you to the mission committee and the congregation of Bethel Presbyterian for praying and partnering and sending your precious pastor to Pakistan this spring to be with us and ministering the church over there. So, uh, mentioned before, in Pakistan, living in 97% Muslim country, when we greet each other, we say, Salaamu Alaikum. Salaamu Alaikum is the Arabic of a Hebrew, Shalom Alaikum. So, if we, I say, Salaam Alaikum, the possible response would be, Wa Alaikum Salaam. Can you say that? Wa very good. You are very good students. <laughs> so, so, here we are. I have a, a privilege to be joining with me my two boys and one wife, Shumaila, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so they are here, and uh, so uh, we are enjoying a warm and wonderful hospitality of Dee Dee's, Derek and Darla, and we are staying at their home. Thank you very much for your uh, love and care. So let's turn to the Word of God, and then we will pray. I'm reading from the scripture, Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 16 till 21. Jesus walks on the water. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the water grew rough. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Don't be afraid. Can you turn your face each other and say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bless you and thank you for your incarnated word, which pitched among us, he lived among us. And then your written word reaches through the faithful witness of your servants from centuries and reached to our generation. We praise you and thank you for this privilege to have and also this morning be a blessing to this congregation and bless the each word and the encouragement which comes out from my mouth. And we ask in the Jesus' strong name. Amen. In March 2018, when I was finished my coursework at Fuller Theological Seminary as a PhD student in intercultural studies, focusing on the book of Psalms and Islam, so I had a chance to visit Pakistan to conduct my first field research. And that field research consisted 3S approach with the Sufis, the scholars, and singers to triangulate my research. So it's been after having a three year, three and a half year of coursework and lots of paperwork and permissions and grants and everything. So timing was very critical for me because my HSR approved that I have this specific frame of time and I have to finish, go back and come back and then do it uh, transcription. So we were praying and waiting for that time and time came and I was in Pakistan for five weeks and in the second week, or the th it was almost a third week, when I received a phone call from my wife. And she says that our youngest son, Ethan, who was sitting here, his appendicitis rupture while he was at home in the school, early morning, 
she took him because he was saying he has stomach, but has no idea because, because you know, t- uh, um, kids have stomach for, for various reasons. But went to doctor, she went to doctor, and doctor says, oh, she checked actually stomach and press, and she said, it's nothing wrong and nothing else, you know. But until afternoon, he says he was, he was, he was so much in a pain, he says he can't take that, and he was lying on a floor. And then she took her on a, on a sofa set. But at the evening, he was becoming unconscious, you know. And she thought, and her wit and the sixth sense says that she has to take him to the ER, she ran to take him, left our eldest son Gabriel with the neighbor, and I was in Pakistan conducting my research. And the doctor told her after examining that you came in time because if you don't bring him at ni- before night, he would be sleeping and the whole fluid would be in the body and he would be gone. So that was the perfect timing, both for us and the sudden storm in our life. Because not before I leave, not before after I came back, right in the midst of a mission while I was doing and called in this country and going back and conducting, the timing was critical for both for our family, for our research, and powers against the kingdom of God. How we all feel sometimes that we are struck by a sudden storm which we are not expecting. And timing is there when you feel that you knock down. You feel that you can't do anything. And in my case, sitting in a hundred and thousand miles away in a country, and while here my wife had left another son, somebody else's home, and running and to ER, and then facing all this by her own self, and without having any resources or friends around here, and that was a sudden storm which our life faces. But as somebody said that, life happens when we leave home. Because until we we can't expect what life would be thrown to us and what we are passing through. Another proverb is saying that each and every moment we are composing our lives. So the question and the challenge which I want to raise with you under the entitled Fearless Faith is, what is your composition of life? What rules your life? What is your modus operandi? Who operates your directions? Fear or faith? Worry or worship? Chaos or calmness? What is our operandi? In the text which we have read this morning, we have seen that Jesus have taught various lessons around the boats to his disciples. In this particular scripture which we have read, there were three basic lessons which I call 3B lessons. By the way, my wife has designed a curriculum which she called 3B club. That is believe, behave, and behavior. But this 3B is different than a disciple learned that Jesus as a bread of life, how he fed thousand and thousand people and how after feeding these people from five loaves and two fishes, they collected 12 baskets, that second B after bread, then the second B of the baskets of the abundance. And now right after this extraordinary experience, they have encountered a storm in the boat. That's three, third B they encountered. So what Jesus was teaching them. We all know that Bible presents water in a way that, that is a symbolism of powers sometimes which are against God's, God's kingdom, against God's rule. Like we see that also water is a symbol in a biblical narrative which shows chaos, evil, abyss, which God control, which God design, and which God rule over it. Book of Revelation told us that the beast will come out from the water at the end of the day. So these disciples have been right in the middle of the water and they have been struck by a storm by the invisible powers. And water is a sign of, uh, it's a visible sign of invisible powers. So what is happening there? We, we also read that in a, one of our professors, he was at Fuller, he was a very famous hist- uh, anthropologist and a missionary in India. His name was Paul Hebert. 
Paul Hebert talk about excluded middle. Excluded middle is a concept in the Western academia which has been excluded from the Western worldview, from the academics. And this excluded middle, the first one is on the top, which is God and the creative order, and then the human being on the world. But the unseen power, invisible powers, which are spirits and demons and evils and, and all this stuff, it has been totally excluded. We have made, give them modern names like um, stress, we call stress, you know, and depression. These are modern medical names. And what doctor gives you when you are stressed? They give you a pill. Okay, they ask you, go and sleep. Because stress is not a disease. What is stress then? Stress is a state of fear, actually. Which capture our mind. That's, that's what I'm, I'm imagine, imagining. That, that was kind of an excluded middle from the, from the understanding. Well, in this, in this sign, in the, in the situation of the disciples, st- disciples were terrified And they're terrified from this invisible power of wind and water. You you might remember what Jesus was ministering at the shore. He was casting out demons. He was casting, he was healing people. And and he was ministering people from from morning till night and spending night on the mountain with a prayer to recharge himself in the presence of of God the Father. But, But the disciples were right in the middle of the storm and they were terrified. And John used the word phobia. And, and we all experience different kind of phobia. Sometime in my context and in, in, the, in the political arena, we might be people are Islamophobic. People are, might, be, uh, might be terrorist phobic. People are, might be immigrant phobic. People are, might, be, uh, might be relational phobic. There are different kind of fears which surround and, and we might live in. Sometimes we have a medical phobic. Your medical report saying something different. Your circumstances, you are living in the state of fear all the time. You are sleeping with pills and you are awakening with medicines. So we are, we are facing different kind of phobias. So disciples were in the form of phobia which was mostly the phobia of water, the phobia of storm, the phobia of death. And, and, and in this context, when it was dark, and we see that, if, if I see they've, since dark they saw the Jesus at 3 a.m., they were in the darkness at the same position circling around from 8 p.m. till 3 a.m. What's happening there? So disciples were terrified and phobic from 3D. Three-dimensional. They were phobic of darkness. They were phobic of demons. And they were phobic of death. That's why their initial response when they saw Jesus, what was that? Oh, it's a ghost. Because they, they, were, they have perception that they were under attack by unseen invisible powers. So what's happened when you are under this kind of impression? And what's happened to your mind when somebody encounter a fear like, like we did? And Ethan was in the, in the ER, ended up in the ER, and doctor gave us medicines, and they said that we cannot operate until all his fluid been dried inside, and then we will operate it. So... We have to wait for five weeks. But that was state of fear. What happened if something happened again? You know, you don't know if medicine worked or not. What could be happened to this young boy, which he can't even tell that what's happening inside his tummy. So sometimes when we are under the demonic satanic attack, for me, it has nothing to do with his physical uh, uh, disease. For me, it was direct spiritual attack. Why? Because of the timing. The timing, why? And the work which I was doing. And we, this is not the first time. Every time we always talk, every time whenever we are on a mission and we are doing something big and something for the kingdom of God, first of all, we expect that something going to be happen. Because as soon as you become Christian, as soon as you become a part of God's mission, you are right away in a war zone. So, and this is a normal operand, this is a normal thing. So what's happened when we are under the effect of fear? Three things happen. I call it BCD effect. 
Number one, we come under blind and blur vision. Delusion of coast, delusion of a life. We, our mind creates negativity into our perception. We, we fantasize things and we imagine destruction and these kind of things come into our mind. This is we call delusion of coast, which they have. Number two, it creates false reality. Because we are not focusing on the promises of God, what God has said to us, we are promising and we are looking around the circumstances and the reports and the papers and what people and what situation, what media is telling us. Number three, it dominates our direction and we stuck over there. These disciples were struck at the same space. They were circling around for more than six hours. They were not going anywhere. So these three things happened to them. The question which I want to pose you this morning, what kind of phobia you are facing? Are you phobic of Islam, building relationship, connecting people, immigrants, terrorists, gun attack in school, religious places, dark nights, scary, creepy, monsters of policies, or police brutality, slavery, war, hunger, religious extremism, death of loved one? What ruling our life? How we are dealing with that? In the, in, in the American context, we all know that American Christianities and the churches are crumbling. Case study, in, according to Atlantic, recently, which I read two weeks ago, America's, they called epidemic of empty churches. 6,000 to 10,000 churches die every year in America. And that number will likely grow. How the church is responding to that fear? Where is our boat, our sailing boat on the same place? Are we on a, uh, one of a conference I was attending and one presenter used the term of a rocking chair church? The rocking chair church you means you rock, you move, you put energy, you are doing something, but you are not moving anywhere. I call it also sugar-coated church. You know donuts here? Donuts are very powerful. Duncan Donuts, I had a coffee the other day. So Duncan Donuts, what's happened? If you are hungry and you, are, or you have a sweet tooth, you are craving for a sugar. But what's happened if you eat one donut? It will just right away, it will wipe out your hunger. But right within a minute, what will happen? You want because that sugar is not providing nutrition our body needs. So sometimes churches are under this one. So what is our desired destiny? How to break the chains and cycle of fear? Are you managing your fear or are you fixing your fear? There are two different things. Sometimes we manage things because we can't fix them. Bible tell us. And the Christian faith tell us, you are not manager, you are a fixer actually. You can fix that. So how, how can we fix that? When you are in Christ, it is your choice to surrender to the bondage and stronghold of fear, Galatians 5.1. So God interrupt and expel, rebuke the spirit of fear. Because first, Second Timothy 1.7 says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. Fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So how to stand firm? I'm, spend, I'm, I'm saving your $300 now with the medical experiment, you know. Number one. First of all, how to face? Number one first thing is I want to tell you another story. Uh, in 2012, when God was calling me to engage at a larger scale of a Sufi shrine's Sufism, mystic, Islamic mysticism, you know. So they have, a, they have a more than 70 to 80 network of Sufi shrines. Millions and millions of people go to their annual festivals and they use music and art and dance and everything and they connect with, with over there. So God has given me this vision to engage with the Sufis. Now, we never had this missional approach in Pakistan. 
Why? Because we are living in 97% Muslim country and you are under the blasphemy law. Public evangelism is banned and if you convert anybody, you will be in prison. So how to deal with that? Mostly Western missions like OM team, OM campus crew and the YWAM and the, and the other Western missionary ideology, they were says that you, make a, you made some uh, uh, pamphlets, flyers about Christian faith um, and, and go to these public festival, distribute illegally and if you caught up, you are beaten up, you may ran or you may give bribe to police and run away. These were the Western mission model we have already there. All the mission players. So what could be the local cultural? So I told God, I said, God, well, I am not going from a back door. I will going from the front door. And through this front door, my half of team says we are not going. I encourage young students of our, our, our music school and I said, would you like to join us because we are going to sing psalms at the Sufi shrine. And youngsters agreed. They said, oh yes, let's go. Let's have adventure. And the most senior, most wise people, most resourceful people, oh, you will go this time, we will go next time. And somebody told me, you are entering in a dragon's mouth. You may not come out. I said, okay, let's see what's happened. So, and the amazing thing was, when we reached over there, the chief Sufi shrine, he said to me, this shrine is existing in this country from 370 years, and you are the first Christian delegate who ever came to this. And they invited local media to cover that event. So rather than going from back door, we went to front door, and God opened that door for us. Facing fear, how can you overcome that fear? Number one, first, I call it 3P operatives. Number one, peace in the storm, not calmness. So how, did, how can we attain this peace? The counter of fear is faith, but the faith related on the and foundation on the peace. Once you accept, we, this visible, physical, and invisible powers go against you, but the problem is not the fruit, the problem is the root. So we have to encounter the root. And you can encounter this root, number one is the peace. Jesus said, Peace I give you, my peace, not world peace. How the world give you? World give you peace, temporary peace. World will give you peace in form of injection, in form of a tablet, in form of a pill, not in the form of a gospel. And that peace is temporary. Jesus offered the peace which is eternal. So biblical peace is not from outside, it is from inside. The direction is not from outside because it will temporary, but it, we need to be understand that this peace comes from inside. The second P which we need to relate is our participation in Missio Day, the God's mission. As one missionary says that the church of God has not a mission to do, it is a God who has a church for his mission. So God, the missionary God, sent his missionary son to establish missionary church to engage. That is when Jesus said, uh, and the, after he resurrected in the Gospel of John chapter 20, he says, peace I give you as Father has sent me, I send you. So this is a great commission through the Johannian gospel which Jesus has given us. When we are participating with God's mission and you will be surprised, sometimes we think that our church, our mission agency or my family or myself is doing some mission. No, no, that's totally wrong conception. Mission is God's. We are only participating what God is already doing something out there. And when we go out, as I mentioned before, life happens when we leave home. And you see, oh, God is already there. It is our privilege to participate in God's mission. And I thank you, this Bethel Church and Reverend Tom, by participating in God's mission and bringing surprises to all of you what God is doing already in the world. And the third P is prayer. So what's happened when Ethan was in a surgery? So we were using medicine, five weeks time, and meanwhile, doctor told us that you have to find a, an, a surgeon who could operate that and take out this appendicitis. So we were using medicine, and we talked a couple of uh, doctors in the Huntington Hospital in Pasadena, and a couple of other doctors, and they says, oh, well, your um, insurance, you know, 
it's not covering. Uh, we can might make a, a plan with you, and it might be cost twelve thousand dollar. And we said, oh, we don't have twelve hundred dollar. You are asking twelve thousand dollar. <laughs> right? I said, well, God, this this is this is this is here your deal. You have given us this boy, and it is your. We are committed and serving you. So now it's your deal. We are only praying. We are only waiting for this five weeks to, to dry out his appendicitis. And let's see what's happened. So what's happened? We took him for a final examination to the same lady doctor who said, oh, he has nothing. You remember I told you? She said, oh, she has nothing. He's, he's fine. You know? So she said, oh, I'm so sorry. And she, she was under guilt, actually. You know? She said, oh, I'm so sorry, uh, we, I was not aware. And she said, but I can give you one number. Why not if you call to the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles? Call them and appoint them and let's see what's happened. So what's happened? We called and the doctor who was there and the patient, they receive our call, they have all these references and all these reports and they said, okay, we are giving you this, 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 this day. Please bring this boy 5 a.m. We are, we are operating his operation first in that morning. And I said, how much cost? Because in my mind, what was running? $12,000. I said, wow, now let's come to the deal. And she says, oh, nothing, zero. You don't need to pay a zero amount. We went on that morning, Ethan surgery was conducted, and we took him to home, and now he was running, he was just here. So, so, so that's one, when you have inner peace, whatever happening outside, whatever doctor's bills are saying to you, whatever your situation is saying to you, whatever, whatever the news is saying to you, whatever the, your, your surrounding says to you, but when you have these three P operatives, number one, peace of Christ, not peace of the world. Number two, participation in God's mission. And number three, prayer. That will change everything. And you have peace that beyond human understanding. That's what people don't understand. Why I'm a jobless, why, why I don't have money, why I'm in the, under the medical bill, why I'm under the, under the burden of the finances, why I'm, I'm in the, at the edge of the relationship, broken relationship, and I am singing and calm, not chaotic. Why? Because inner peace that surpasses all understanding. So I hope you will remind three P operatives in your life. First P, peace, peace of Christ. Not, 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 not out of peace, not world peace, not pills peace, not injection peace. Which peace? Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Second, in God's mission. And number three, prayer. prayer. And you will be a part of extraordinary supernatural move of God. May God bless you.